from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tom Sherwood from NBC4 here in Washington and every Friday on the Kojo Nandi Show on WAMU Radio. <laughs> Being from TV, we're not going to waste even a minute getting to the main event. Thank you for being part of the Library of Congress National Book Festival. A few weeks ago, there was a big stir when a South Carolina congressman shouted, you lie, at President Obama as he gave his health care speech. For any of you who have already read Gwen Eiffel's book on modern American politics and race, that remarkable incident would be just an exclamation point to recommend her book, The Breakthrough, Politics and Race in the Age of Obama. The New York Times, where Gwen once worked, praised her work. It noted how Gwen Eiffel explores African-American politicians and politics, well known or not, who were all shaped by the civil rights movement. President Obama is only the most prominent member. Gwen Eiffel is also a former writer for the Washington Post, where she and I were, for a short time, colleagues. She's now the well-regarded moderator of Washington Week on PBS and a valued staff member, contributor, and ideas person for the News Hour with Jim Lehrer. It is the Library of Congress's great pleasure and pride and mine to welcome Gwen Eiffel to the National Book Festival. Thank you. Thank you. You'll be sorry you clapped so long because we'll be out of time in no time. So I really want to get started. First of all, Tom Sherwood has stories he could tell about me, and he's not. So the best part is that it's mutually assured destruction. I could tell stories about him, too. So it works out really well. I'm really thrilled to see you here, especially since I know that you're really just here to stay dry. So I appreciate that especially. But I also wanted to talk to you about a book and a subject which it turns out never gets old. Little did I know when I set out to write this book about race that we would never stop talking about it in this country. That every few months there would be another little mini explosion which would force us to navel gaze and freak out about it all over again. But that's not why I wrote this book. I wrote this book because I was approached by a publisher to write a book about Barack Obama, this freshman senator who I knew would never be president. <laughs> so understand, first of all, that I am not a pundit for a reason, because I'm always wrong. But I did see uh, the kernel of a bigger story here to, in my mind, which is it wasn't just about Barack Obama. It was about a whole generation of incredibly well-educated, smart, motivated, and most importantly, uh, service-oriented African Americans who were getting the chance to walk through the doors their parents had opened. I, I, I realized when I sat down and started to think about how to write this book that some way or the other, in my years in journalism, of which I'm now <clears throat> above 30, shockingly, how did that, anyway, that I had come across a lot of these people and that I had come across a lot of their stories. I, I'll just start, I want to read a little bit to you from the opening of the book because that tells you as much as any, I can tell you about how I came to write this. I learned how to cover race riots by telephone. They didn't pay me enough at my first newspaper job to venture onto the grounds of South Boston High School when bricks were being thrown. Instead, I would telephone the headmaster and ask him to relay to me the number of broken chairs in the cafeteria each day. A white colleague would then be dispatched to follow up and fill in the details for me. I have spent 30 years since then chronicling stories just like that, places where truth and consequences collide, rub up against each other, and shift history's course. And none of that prepared me for, the, for 2008 and the astonishing rise of Barack Obama. It's true that he accomplished what no black man had before, but it went further than that. Simply as an exercise in efficient politics, Obama 08 rewrote the textbook. His accomplishment was historic and one that transformed how race and politics intersect in our society. Obama is the leading edge of that change, however, but his success is merely the ripple in a pond that grows deeper every day. So not having written a book before, I thought, well, how does one do such a thing? Well, I do what I do as a journalist, which I interviewed people. And the more people I interviewed, they would point me out to someone else, and someone else, and someone else. And I began to discover that they had a lot of common stories, that Barack Obama and Deval Patrick, the governor of Massachusetts, and Arthur Davis, who is a congressman from Alabama who's running for governor of Alabama this year, talk about audacity of hope. 
I mean, you know, and that might happen. We have a black president, who knows? And Cory Booker, the mayor of Newark, New Jersey. And the more I talked, oh, Newark's in the house, yeah. <laughs> and the more I talked to them, the more I heard them saying the same things. For instance, that they were told that they couldn't do it. Each of them had run against an entrenched black incumbent and lost the first time they tried, and they tried it again. The more I talked to them, the more it became clear to me that they were all answering the same questions like, are you really black enough? You know, you're an educated person. Is that really black? Or they were being told they were too black because they associated with controversial preachers or things. So along the way, I began to say there's something common that they have in common. One of the things they had in common is, this, is the soft spot that I have for politicians, is that as many rogues as there are, as many crazy ones as there seem to be periodically, um, I have always, the vast majority of the politicians I've ever interviewed are interesting people who are engaged in public service, who want to do something for the right reasons and want to represent. So here was a group of people who wanted to represent, but who, however, had never marched on the mall to the Lincoln Memorial, had never sat in a, at a lunch counter. In fact, they didn't know what lunch counters were by the time they came along. They were people in their 40s, some in their early 50s, but younger who all of a sudden said, well, I have this opportunity, what can I do with it? As I came along, I, I, ca I came along a couple of interesting things, and I'm racing through because I really want to leave time for your questions because that's when I get, hi, Bert. That's when I get, my brother, I'm sorry. That's when I get the most interesting part of this. When I start to hear what you are thinking, because so much has happened since this book came out, obviously. But I found out that there were legacy issues. There were fathers and daughters and mothers and sons who are passing the reins on to each other for the first time in the African-American community. Kendrick Meek, who's running for senator from Florida, is the son of Kerry Meek, whose seat he literally inherited in Florida, his congressional seat. And the more Jesse Jackson Jr., of course, is the son of Jesse Jackson Sr., and told me some pretty revealing things about how he sees the world differently than the way his father sees the world. And his father agrees. I'd like to be at Thanksgiving at their house sometime. I think it would be very interesting. But the more I began to talk to them, the more I began to say we're at an interesting crossroads. And it's only proved itself to be more interesting as time has gone along. When Harvard professors are arrested on the front porch of their houses, all of a sudden we have another national debate. When a former president attributes uh, criticism of the current president to race, we have another debate. Now, the question is, is the debate about whether race is good or bad? I happen to think it's a good thing. People think that Barack Obama represented some sort of post-racial ideal. I honestly don't understand why we are striving for a post-racial ideal. What is, what, that we as Americans, I believe, can embrace what it is we are, understanding it's not all of whom we are. And if we can do that, we can begin to embrace each other and understand the accomplishments all around us. So I've been having a great time traveling the country and talking to people. I've had people in audiences say things to me like, why do you keep mentioning that he's black? Can't you just forget it? And I think, well, that's really interesting because I'm not sure why I would want to, unless you think it's a bad thing, and which causes them to think about it. I had another man say to me, you know, you're really well-spoken. And, which is a good thing since I'm on TV and all. But, <laughs> but he said, you know, and so is the president. Does that mean that if all black people were well-spoken that maybe they could all succeed? Now, in the audience, you can imagine there was, <gasps> there was a lot of that. And I said to him, well, are you telling me that all the white people you know are well-spoken? Because that's not my experience. And, uh, but it paused, it gave him a chance to stop and think about what he had said and how he had phrased it and whether it was real or not. It actually gave me a chance to think also about people who have these conversations in their homes and never come out and have them in public. And they form entrenched opinions about each other without getting to know each other. We're at a wonderful crossroads in our history when it comes to leadership. And we have shown ourselves as a country possible, uh, capable of embracing all kinds of leadership. The question is, what do we do with that next? How do we embrace that? And how do we create a next generation of breakthrough who walk through the doors that these breakthroughs have created? So I want to stop there, because I really want to get your questions. And I look forward to them. There are microphones here. There are microphones here. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you, you always have to beware the first person who comes to the mic. I'm just telling you. Hi. 
how do you uh, see uh, associating with uh, certain uh, black preachers uh, affecting the blackness of a candidate? Okay, my father was a preacher, right? First question. So certain black preachers isn't necessarily the, the problem. Um, he's referring, I think, as I was referring to, the Jeremiah Wright episode in which uh, Barack Obama, I don't have to tell you what it is, Barack Obama's pastor said some pretty explosive things. And, and, and after a certain amount of time, the, the candidate had to disassociate himself from it. What was wrong, and what, what went wrong with Barack Obama and his pastor and anybody who associates with someone controversial is not race, and it's not even what he said. It's difference. Any politician worth his salt, no matter what color, no matter what background, is trying to lessen the amount of difference between them and the people whose votes they're asking for. They're wanting to tell, sell you on the idea that I care about your issues and I am more like you than unlike you. Anything that happens which makes a voter stop and think, he doesn't get me, is going to lose you a vote. And that's what a Jeremiah Wright episode did. That's what, and I can name, I can go through all of the scandals I've covered with different candidates over the years. But the fact is, they all want to do something. They want you to say, I feel your pain. They want you to they get that you get them. And to the extent that race, which is always um, a, a flashpoint in our society, magnifies any sense of difference, uh, it becomes even a bigger problem. So this is why you have a president who doesn't really like to talk that much about race. Because it's not that he doesn't see himself as an African American, it's that he knows that anything he does that makes him seem different from people who he wants to support him is going to make it difficult for him to sell his policies and his plans. Yes, sir. Oh, there's somebody over here. Hi. Hi. Um, this question kind of dovetails on that. I'm wondering if you could comment on the recent reports of President Obama asking uh, Governor Patterson to drop out of the race and seeing as how Governor Patterson's only one of two African-American governors in the entire country, what that says about uh, the president's uh, identity as first a politician, possibly, and then secondly as an African-American man. Did everybody hear the question? It's about uh, b reports that President Obama or his staff um, approached uh, Governor David Patterson of New York or his staff and suggested that maybe he not run for governor again. Um, and she wanted to know what does it mean to have a an African-American president ask one of only two African-American governors basically to step aside. I think that had less to do with about race than it had to do with about politics. Sometimes we have to just step back and understand race is not always the driver. I think last I checked, Governor Patterson was at 22% approval rating on a good day. He's not doing really well in his popularity in New York. Uh, politicians want to hold the state houses. They want to, more importantly, do something to make sure that, up, that congressional races um, are not harmed by it, someone who's weak at the top of that ticket. So uh, my understanding is that folks in the White House approached folks in the governor's office and asked him to step aside, mostly because they're trying to find a way to preserve the Democratic majorities, not because they, it has anything to do with one black man speaking to another black man. Hi. Hi. Um, sorry for the two-part question, but I can't resist asking you to summarize your feelings about your role during the campaign when you were making the news and not just reporting it. When yeah. You, secondly, um, uh, I was here on Inauguration Day and very happy to be part of history. What do you think would have happened if, uh, in the black community? What would have been their feeling if, if Obama had lost the election? Uh, he has two questions. One is how I felt being part of the news instead of covering the news at one point during the campaign. And the other was, how would the black community have felt if Barack Obama had not been elected? Um, as quietly as it's kept, I don't speak for the entire black community. <laughs> but, but, I, but, I, but I know what you're asking, and I, and I don't know that there's an answer to that question. I don't think uh, there was a, any more a lockstep uniform idea about what was expected of this campaign among black folk than there was among white folk. In fact, I, it's, it's quietly as it's kept, black voters were late to the party in 2008. They honestly did not think that he would be elected, and they didn't support him until he won in Iowa. When white people voted for him, they went, oh, well, maybe, maybe I'll reconsider this. And also, it should be said, he was running against Hillary Clinton, who was very, had her own popular base in the African-American community. So I, I don't know that there would have, I mean, what, would there have been an uprising? I don't think so. I think folks would have just thought, well, you know, he lost. Uh, the first part of the question about how it felt like being part of the story, uh, uh, when I moderated the vice presidential debate, um, you may have heard of it. Um, 
the, the worst part of it was in preparing for the debate, which I had been doing for months, I, um, I discovered, uh, well, th about three different things happened. One is two nights before the debate, I fell down the stairs at home and broke my ankle. It was very painful, yes. But the good thing about that is it kept me so distracted that I didn't notice all the bloggers decided at once they hated me. <laughs> and they decided that because much to their shock and dismay, it turned out I was writing a book. The book they thought I was writing, or they said I was writing, they said was a puff piece about Barack Obama. The book I indeed was writing, as I have described to you today, was not that book. Uh, it didn't matter, you see, because uh, there was some effort to discredit me as an African-American um, moderating a debate in a year when an African-American was making a real run at things. I, n never mind that I was actually moderating the vice presidential debate, but whatever. Um, I, fortunately, because I'm surrounded by people who love and care for me, was pretty much sealed off from a lot of the debate that preceded the debate because it just wasn't going to serve my purpose. It also didn't serve my purpose to, arg to get into an argument about what the book was or was not prior to the debate because I figured the book would tell its own story. And so I was, between trying to figure out how to walk on crutches on a stage with 46 million people watching, which trust me, is not a small thing. They had football players help me out. It was very cute. <laughs> Buck and Tim. <laughs> the high point of the week. <laughs> and th that kept me pretty much focused on the task at hand, which was finding a way, and I had moderated a vice presidential debate four years earlier, and my goal was to find a way to introduce to people these folks who are going to be a heartbeat away from the presidency and understand how they would govern if they, God forbid, should ever become president. So I stayed with that. I didn't change a question I wrote before all the boo-ha-ha -ha broke out. The third great thing that happened uh, during the debate, after the debate, was uh, Saturday Night Live, in which... <laughs> now, you know, there's nothing wrong about being portrayed by Queen Latifah on Saturday Night Live. The truth is she had done it four years before at when I moderated the Edwards-Cheney uh, debate. And it, it, for some reason, it got a lot less attention. I think because Tina Fey wasn't on stage. <laughs> and it was actually, you know what? There's nothing wrong in the world with having a big movie star who can sing represent you on television, especially since the other option was one of the guys. <laughs> Thanks. I just wanted to uh, pick up on your point about um, when we say black, blah, 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 Asian, blah, blah, blah. If you can Senator, talk right into sorry, the mic, I think uh, that'll help. Senator, Congressman, whatever, but always preceding that with some characteristic of whether it's the race or whether it's female. How does that jibe with the fact that we never say white, blah, blah, blah? As long as this is a majority white culture, the assumption on many parts is that if race is not mentioned, that you're white. Uh, there, but that's, that, that, I'm not saying that's what it ought to be, but right. there is a certain invisibility which is granted status of being Caucasian in a majority white culture. That's what it is. I, don't, I, I think we get a little too hung up with the idea that labels are a bad thing. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no reason why you can't decide who you are and label yourself that way if you choose or not if you choose. I mean, Tiger Woods is what, Cablin Asian? I got no problem with that. Mm -hmm. that's, what he, that's something he made up. It really works for him. And it works for me to be African American or for you to be whatever you are. I just, it, I just don't really think it's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So it, it seems to me that one of the biggest, most impactful things that could happen in politics, um, and, and probably best, is term limits in Congress. First, do you agree? Second, what would the impact of that be? There have been term limits imposed in many, many, many places, and including in the governors in Virginia. And um, I guess there are two arguments about term limits, and it's, they're not new arguments. They're, term limits mean that you end up with people who have less expertise because they're not there as long. Or term limits are good because you get fresh blood every four years, but you're starting from scratch every four years or two years in the case of Congress. I don't have a point of view about it, frankly. I think it can work either way for the good or the ill. There are people who have been on Capitol Hill for 30 years who I'm glad are there. And there are people who have been there for two who I wish would rethink. <laughs> so that's it. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I'm a children's librarian, and I'm reading this beautiful book that was set in 1963 about a young African-American girl. And um, a white man leaves this southern community a mutual garden and that sets off just a, a just total split in the town. And when it, it recalls the Medgar Evers murder, 
and the bombing in Birmingham. And I think about this in light of the charges, you know, about what Jimmy Carter said about racism today, and I, I get a little shocked. I think, my God, I was 11 years old. And it's not that many generations, it seems, because of Obama, you know, it's so long ago. Can I ask you to get to your question? We don't have a lot of time. Okay, on. so my question is how, you know, I read this book and I think, how are attitudes, there is racism, how can attitudes that, you know, are that divisive and, and visceral and mean <laughs> change in one or two generations? Aren't people going to pass it down? I mean, that's what Boy, I Boy, if I knew the answer to that question, <laughs> I would be so much brighter than I actually am. I, I don't know the answer to that question. I, the question was, in general, how do we still have racism in America, in this world? I know it was more complicated than that, but I don't really, you know, I, I think the question is accept it for what it is. My, my sense is it is not an overwhelming point of view, and you factor it into your thinking. You understand that it is what it is, and then you move on. I, I just don't spend a lot of time feeling depressed about race or feeling that, well, I can't believe America isn't where it ought to be. Well, you know, we're not where we ought to be in a lot of things, but I, I, I'm pretty hopeful, actually. I only have time for very quick questions from you and you, and then I got to sit down. So I'll start with you. I know you were just asked to speak on behalf of all black people. I'm going to ask you to speak on behalf of white people now. Um, Thank you. I was, I was wondering, when, when certain pundits, if you can call them that, like uh, Glenn Beck and, and Sean Hannity, suggest that Barack Obama may be racist, that he resents white people for whatever, how do you think that's received in mainstream America, the, the invisible Caucasian community? I'm never asked to speak for white people, so help me. Um, <laughs> I think there are people who will always want to hear certain things. And the thing, the, the, one of the joys of our incredibly sliced up media culture is you can find someone who will say something you want. The bad side of that is you stop listening to another point of view. And so there are people who will always, who really are threatened by the idea of talking about race, whether it's black people talking about race, white people talking about race, whatever. They don't do a service to the rest of us by not having a really honest conversation and just going for the jugular. But I, I also think that it's not the worst thing that could happen to us to have lively debate and people with wildly divergent views, as long as we keep talking to each other. My fear is we go home and we sit down in our rooms and we talk to ourselves and we stare at our navels and we watch the TV and we get angry. And we never talk to anyone who has a different point of view or consider the possibility that a different point of view might be a reasonable one. That's what I kind of live for. Thank you. No pressure, final question, <laughs> that'll be good. All right, oh, this is tough. Um, I really am glad you brought up Jimmy Carter's comments in the post about um, uh, how the healthcare debate has been kind of masking these, this racial undertone. But I want to know, um, you know, race is discussed in academic literary circles like we are right now, but it's so rarely seen on the headlines of the, you know, nightly news. And I want to know where, where is the media's role, in your opinion, to bring to light the fact that at a lot of these healthcare town hall meetings, it's not just an anti public sector healthcare they're saying, they're, they're saying racial slurs, and that's never covered on CNN. And where do you think the, the role of the media is in that? Because I, I guess, think, you know, I, I think actually think our role is to take note of those slurs, but not to blow, blow them up so that they seem to be the dominant discussion that's happening at these meetings, because they're not. You know, healthcare is a complicated and difficult situation. It's hard to figure out how to do People are going to have lots of reasons for opposing this president. The idea that America, eight months ago, was able to, well, I guess a year ago almost now, and elected an African-American president. When the president said the other day on Letterman, you know, it turns out I was black before. <laughs> what he meant by that, I mean, it was a funny line, but he also meant that Americans turned out and voted for him in spite or because of that. So if that's true, then how can it also be true that suddenly the occasional slur is the, a threat to our culture or to our constitution? I don't think it is. I think we can withstand it. I think it's possible there are always going to be someone who's going to say something nasty and mean and awful and low, but that we have to decide to put that in some sort of larger context. I do think we are covering it. And frankly, on PBS, we're really covering it really well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But listen. 
Thank you all very much. I really appreciated this. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.